Greetings and blessings to you from Global Harvest Assembly. We pray that this message will ignite a passion for Jesus Christ in your heart and encourage you to live out your faith boldly. May you encounter God's love and grace in a powerful way today. Uh, believers don't have freedom to go to a house of worship. They have to do it secretly. And so we're so thankful that we have that freedom in this nation. So before we jump into the Word of God, let's just commit our time together in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your presence. Uh, we thank you that you are here because you said when two or three are gathered together in your name, there you are in the midst of us. And so we just welcome you. We thank you. We praise you. We exalt you this morning. We ask, Father, that you would light our hearts on fire for you, that you would give us a revelation even as Doreen shared, that we would be mindful that we don't live forever. Because you said your word says that you have placed eternity in our hearts. I thank you for making us aware of that truth and that you would lead us into friendships and conversations where we can share that truth as well. That we do live for eternity and we want to make sure that we spend eternity with you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, before we get started, you know, once upon a time, um, churches used to print bulletins. You remember, you remember the the church bulletins. It, it's not some churches still do it. Now we're pretty digital, but uh, here are some actual church bloopers from their bulletins. So these are announcements that were printed and handed out to the congregation with some mistakes. Right. So announcement number one. The low self-esteem group will meet on Thursday from 7 to 8.30 p.m. Please make sure to use the back door. <laughs> it doesn't do a lot for people's self-esteem. Okay. Uh, number two, for those who have children and don't know it, there's a nursery downstairs. So if you weren't sure you had a child, just check out the nursery and make sure. Number three, the pastor will preach his farewell message, after which the choir will sing, Break Forth with Joy. <laughs> and number four, remember in prayer this morning, those who are sick of our church and community. <laughs> minor typo. And lastly, ladies, don't forget the jumble cell. It's a great chance to get rid of those things not worth keeping around the house. Make sure to bring your husbands. <laughs> so, minor church members. Okay? Well, this morning, we're going to carry on with the topic of who's your one. Who's the one person that the Holy Spirit has put on your heart that you can be reaching out to, that you can be praying for with the goal of you sharing the gospel with them? Right? Who's your number one? All right, who's your one? The last time I spoke, we talked about what it means to be a Christian. And we know that the world has a variety of definitions of what it means to be a Christian. But we discovered that to be a Christian means that you're a follower of Jesus, okay? That you're a disciple. And that Jesus calls us, and we respond to that call. That's what we discovered last time when I was speaking. That to be a follower of Jesus, it means that you're a disciple. And that he calls us first, and we respond to that call. And if we're truly his disciples, then we will bear fruit. We will be fruitful in what we do for his kingdom and advancing his goodness on this planet. So that's what we discovered. We know that uh, in today's society that uh, there are many of us who are sports fans, I'm not so much a sports fan, but I've got three older children, Zoe, Noella, and Matthias, who are all athletic, uh, athletic and they like to participate in sports. So I, uh, Pastor Ruben and I have been to rugby games, we've been to soccer games, we've been to basketball games, and our youngest, Johanan, he's really interested in chess, and so he's on the, you know, playing competitive chess now. And you know, uh, yesterday, Johanan was at a chess tournament and uh, he was competing for the under 10 age group 
and he came in second. And he was so, he was so proud of him. And you know, he, he got a prize, he got a certificate. And this morning, I, I, I was talking with Pastor Ruben and Johanna, and I said, isn't that so exciting? I'm going to share with the church how I, I won second place in a chess tournament. And Johanna said, you won second place. I was like, well, yeah, I was cheering for you. I, I, I was praying for you that you would win, and then you won. He's like, but mommy, I won. I won second place. You didn't win, right? Sometimes we can make the same mistake where we are cheering for those who are doing the good work of sharing the gospel. We're cheering, rah, 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 go, go, go. But are we actually participating? See, there's a difference between being a spectator or you're watching and being a player or a participant. So this morning, I'm challenging each one of us to not just be an encourager and, yes, I encourage you to share the gospel, but that you would actually be a participant in advancing the kingdom of God because that's what we're called to be. Not just spectators, but those of us who are actively building the kingdom of God. And do you know that each and every one of you has the grace and the capacity and the ability to help advance the kingdom of God? Did you know that? It's not just last time I spoke, we explained that it's not just for a few select people, it's not just for special people. If you have been called by Jesus, which you have, you have been equipped, amen, for this purpose. So our main text is actually going to come out of Luke chapter 5, and I want to just read it to you so that um, we can talk about what it is that the Lord is wanting us to do this morning. And so this is taken from Luke chapter 5, verses 17 through 26, and the, the focus is going to be on us talking about how are we, me, you, how are we actually fulfilling the Great Commission? So we don't just want to be spectators, we want to be participants. Okay? So on one of these days, while Jesus was teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea, and also from Jerusalem. And the Lord's power to heal was in Jesus. Just then, some men came, carrying on a stretcher, a man who was paralyzed. They tried to bring him in and set him down before Jesus. Since they could not find a way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him on the stretcher through the roof tiles in the middle of the crowd before Jesus. Seeing their faith, Jesus said, Friend, your sins are forgiven. Then the scribes and the Pharisees began to think to themselves, Who is this man that speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But Jesus, perceiving their thoughts, replied to them, Why are you thinking this in your hearts? What is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven? Or to say, get up and walk? So that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he told the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your stretcher, and go home. Immediately, the man got up before them and picked up what he had been lying on and went home glorifying God. Then everyone was astounded, and they were giving glory to God, and they were filled with awe and said, we have seen incredible things today. So you remember the story. Jesus is preaching in a home. It's packed. There's standing room only. And a group of friends, they have a buddy, their mate, that is paralyzed. And they say, we have to get him to Jesus. Okay? These men had a mission. They had heard of this man called Jesus of Nazareth. And everywhere he went, he was healing people. And they said, you know what? He might be able to heal our friend. So they set out on a mission to bring their friend to Jesus. And their friend wasn't able-bodied. He was on a stretcher. That means he was laying out flat. And they had to carry him. They were on a mission. 
For some of us, mission actually drives us. We're very missional focused. For some of us, we're not. But these men were on a mission. They were ready to do whatever it took to get their friend to Jesus. Because of that mission, they put in their hearts, you know what? Our friend needs to be healed. They couldn't just sit there and say, oh, maybe if Jesus comes to our neighborhood, we'll bring our friend out. Or maybe if Jesus passes by our synagogue, we'll bring our friend out. They had a mission. We've heard that Jesus can heal. We are going to take our friend to wherever Jesus is right now. They were on a mission. You know, for some, their life mission is to live as comfortable as possible. There's been a great pursuit in the 21st century of living life comfortably. You get your house, you get your car, you get your nice things, you get your nice shoes, your nice clothes, you get your nice job, and that's our aim in life. But there's so much more that the Lord wants to accomplish through us for his kingdom. Jesus had a mission statement. His mission statement can be found in Luke 19.10. His statement was, For the Son of Man has come to seek and save the lost. So if you don't have a personal mission statement for your life, maybe you can adopt Jesus's to seek and save the lost. We need to live on a mission like these men did. We need to live on purpose, being intentional, shifting from being passive to being an active agent of Christ in bringing change to this world. You know, this here is a picture of Bill Wilson. Bill Wilson is the founder of Metro Ministries. And Metro Ministries first began in New York City, and now it's in various places around the world. Uh, when I was 16, I had the opportunity of hearing Bill Wilson first speak at my church. And he shared about his mission to help hurting children. He explained that when he was 12 years old, his mother took him in the car and said, I've got to go run an errand. I'm going to drop you off here, and I'll come back for you. And on the side of a road, she dropped her 12-year-old son, and she drove off. He waited an hour, two, six hours, 24 hours. His mother didn't show. Two days he sat on the curb. His mother didn't show. Three days he sat on the curb. His mother didn't show. A Christian man driving past noticed that this young kid, 12 year old boy, was sitting on the curb. And so he pulled up, said, Hey, what's going on? And Bill told him a story. My name is Bill. My mom dropped me off three days ago. She hasn't come back. This man says, Get in the car. Come. And he took him to a Sunday school camp. He had his kids, gonna take him to a Sunday school camp. He said, okay, you can come with my boys to the Sunday school camp. So Bill Wilson goes to the Sunday school camp. He hasn't eaten properly, he hasn't slept, he hasn't showered, he's dirty. He recalls a story that while he's at the camp, nobody would come near him because he was dirty, he was unclean. At the end of one of the first services, they had an altar call. He said nobody came up and prayed for him. But he went up to the altar himself and he kneeled down and he said, Jesus, my mother doesn't want me. The Christians don't want me. But if you'll have me, I'm yours. And Jesus said, I'll have you. And right there sparked within his heart the mission to make sure that no other child would be left on a street curb like he was. And that began the path that the Lord would take him to start Metro Ministries, a ministry to the poorest of the poor children. His mission to help hurting children, to bring them the gospel of Jesus Christ, 
so that those the world has rejected would know that Jesus has accepted them. That was his mission. To this day, he still lives on a mission. One of the beautiful highlights of my life was when he came to Penang. Pastor Ruben found out about it. And he said, I'm going to arrange for us to have dinner with him. And I thought, oh, I'm going to have dinner with Bill Wilson. <laughs> and it was such a beautiful meal where I was able to recount with him the impact that he made on my life. The time that I spent with him in New York and what an impression that made and still seeing the passion and the fire within him to reach out to the poorest of the poor to tell them the gospel of Jesus Christ. Bill Wilson lives on a mission. Those men were on a mission with their friend. They wanted their friend to get to Jesus. We need to be on a mission. It can't just be Tom Cruise on a mission. We have to be on a mission. These men also had an eager expectation. They expected great things. They heard Jesus was in town, that he was known for healing people, and they brought their friend. They knew something is going to happen. We don't know exactly what's going to happen, but we know that something is going to happen. These men only had a sliver of a revelation of who Jesus actually was. And yet their expectation moved them to action. I'm going to take my friend to Jesus. You and I, we know who Jesus is. We know what Jesus can do. Do we have that same expectation? Are we willing to step out in faith? Like Doreen mentioned, having a sensitivity, Holy Spirit, who's the one person you want me to share about you today? Who's that one person? And then when someone comes, are you willing to step out in faith, take that risk, and say, hey, do you know that Jesus loves you? Do you have an eager expectation for someone that you know to come to faith? Is that a burning desire in your heart? Does it move you? to action, that's my prayer. That not only would it be a, a mental thought, oh, I would love to see someone saved, but that it would actually compel me to action. The gospel moves us forward, and the kingdom moves us forward. We're not spectators, we are participants. We are co-heirs an eager expectation. You know, there was one man in the Old Testament that had an eager expectation. You remember Elijah. And you, you may remember the story of Elijah versus the 850 prophets of Baal. There were 400 and then 400 consorts or whatever. Anyhow, it's a big showdown. If you like Westerns, you can imagine like a Western scene. All of these prophets are chanting and trying to ask their God to consume a sacrifice. Elijah had said, look, let's see whose God is real, your God or my God. And we'll say whoever's God is real is going to answer by fire. So the prophets of Baal took up the challenge and it says from the morning to noon, they were chanting and screaming and crying for their God to consume their sacrifice and nothing happens. So Elijah begins to uh, pick on them a bit. Yeah, maybe your God is sleeping. Maybe he's gone traveling. Maybe he's in the bathroom. Maybe, uh, I don't know, maybe he can't hear you. Scream louder. And they start screaming, and they said they actually started cutting themselves. And he let him carry on till the evening. And he said, okay, that's enough, my turn. So he said, but before I start, go ahead and saturate my sacrifice with water and build a trench and fill it up with water. They did that. And then he just said, God, answer by fire. Immediately, fire from heaven falls down. It says it consumed the entire sacrifice and licked up all the water. 
And in that moment, everyone said, your God is real. Elijah had an eager expectation. He had to expect, otherwise he was going to die for sure. Because he taunted and he put out a challenge. But God did not disappoint him. Jesus will not disappoint us. We have to have an eager expectation. An eager expectation that moves us to action. Are we willing to have bold faith? Are we willing to have bold faith? Elijah had bold faith. Thankfully, I don't think any of us need to have that kind of showdown today. But do you have bold faith enough to step out and tell a friend about Jesus? Are you willing to maybe even just let people know you're a believer? Having eager expectation. You know, these men, these friends of the paralytic, they encountered obstacles. You know the obstacle. <coughs> It was so crowded. There was no way for them to get to, G get to Jesus. The house was completely packed. I can imagine they brought their friend around to the front door, and the front door is full of people. I'd imagine they probably tried to look in a window, and it's completely <coughs> packed with people. So what did they decide to do? Hmm. For some of us, we might have been like, ugh. You know what? It's just not God's will. It's not God's will. There's no room. It's not possible. So let's bring them back and we'll try again another day. But not these friends. In spite of obstacles, they said, ah, let's think. How about the roof? How about the roof? So they managed to climb up on the roof and they carry their friend up the roof. Then they get to the roof and they realize, okay, now what do we do? Whose house is this? I don't know. Uh, let's break the roof. <laughs> and then they break the roof. Wow, talk about audacious faith. They break the roof and then let's lower him down. So Jesus, talk about amazing, bold faith. Jesus is preaching. And can you imagine he's preaching and suddenly sticks and hay and whatever they made their roof starts dropping and he moves aside and keeps preaching and the next thing you know a stretcher is being lowered down these men encountered obstacles but they didn't give up why because a love for a friend was compelling them we've got to get him to jesus he's been a paralytic for too long we've got to see what jesus can do for him Many of us, if we were in the same situation, we may have given up. Because as soon as we come, as soon as we encounter resistance, as soon as we encounter a challenge, as soon as we encounter an obstacle, we might be quick to say, you know, it must not be the will of God. It's too hard. It's too hard. Where would we be if Paul had had the same attitude? Paul, the primary author of the New Testament, do you know what he had to go through in order to pin the New Testament? He talks about the challenges he went to, went through. He said five times he received 40 stripes minus one. And if you don't know what that means, that means being, being beaten, being beaten with a whip that actually tears the flesh. And he, did, he got that five times. One time, Maybe even a threat of one might send many of us running. But he endured it five times. Three times he was beaten by rods. Three times. Once he was actually stoned and walked away from that. Three times he was shipwrecked. You would think after the first shipwreck he might not want to go on a boat. But he did it again and again. Even though three times he encountered shipwreck. One day and night, he was out at sea, just floating, waiting for rescue. 
He said he was in danger. He was in danger from Gentiles. He was in danger from his fellow Jews. He was in danger from those who called themselves Christians, but they actually weren't. And yet he persevered. He persevered. Why? Because he said, telling people about Jesus, communicating the truth about who our God is, is worth the price. Though he encountered obstacle after obstacle after obstacle, he persevered. What are some of the obstacles that have caused us to give up on the mission? The Great Commission. Has it been the obstacle of being disliked? Has it been the obstacle of losing a friend? Has it been the obstacle of persecution? The men encountered obstacles when they tried to bring their friend to Jesus, but they overcame those obstacles. And I'm here to tell you that if you're being led by the Holy Spirit and you are empowered by Him, no matter what challenges we face, if you're on a mission to advance His kingdom and you're being led by His Spirit, He will give you the grace to overcome every obstacle. Remember, the Bible tells us that we are overcomers. How can we be overcomers if we don't overcome anything? If we only want to live a comfortable life, what do we overcome? But we're not just called to be comfortable Christians. We're called to be overcomers, which means that we will overcome obstacles. And you know what? These friends that brought the paralytic, they encountered the miraculous. And that's what takes place when we overcome obstacles, when we overcome persecution, when we overcome resistance, when telling people about Jesus, we will encounter the miraculous. And these men were not disappointed. In fact, they got much more than they bargained for. Because when their friend was lowered down, they witnessed something that was beyond anything that they could possibly imagine. The very first thing that Jesus tells him is, wow, young man, middle-aged man, I don't know how old the man was, but he said, your friend's faith, remarkable. Your sins are forgiven. And then, you know, he could perceive the Pharisees and the Sadducees who were hanging out, well, who is this man to say that somebody's sins are forgiven? Who is he? And Jesus replies, okay, I can hear what you're saying in your mind and in your heart. What is it easier to say, that your sins are forgiven or stand up and walk? And so he told the paralytic, stand up and walk. Pick up your mat and go home. And guess what? He did. He stood up, he walked, and he glorified the Lord. But what was the first thing that Jesus addressed? Not the fact that he couldn't walk. Not the fact that he was paralyzed. The first thing that Jesus addressed was the more serious issue. Your sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. Now, stand up and walk. You know, for many years, when I was living in the U.S., every Friday night, me and my friends, we would go, we would buy maybe six or eight loaves of bread, peanut butter and jelly, and we would make peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, and we would go out on Friday nights, and we would go to under the bridges, um, or in the alleys, the places where the homeless would stay, and near the homeless shelters when we knew that they would, they would be full. And we would go out, and we would pass out peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, because we knew they wouldn't have gotten a meal. And when we were doing that, I remember the first year we were young, very excited, and we would go out and we would do pass out peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and we would, you know, encourage people and say, Jesus loves you and, and give them a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And I felt the Holy Spirit convict me one evening and just said, if you don't share the gospel with them, all you're doing is giving them a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Anybody can give them a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. You have to give the sandwich with the gospel. Just like Jesus, he didn't just say, you're well, stand up, I heal you. But he got to the root of it. Your sins are forgiven. 
I thought, yes, I just can't pass out the peanut butter and jelly sandwich. I have to pass out the peanut butter and jelly sandwich and share the gospel. That's what we're called to do. And when we do that, we encounter the miraculous. When we trust in Jesus, we see that he has transformed our lives and he actually desires to transform the lives of those around us. This is what we desire. <coughs> this morning I want to end with a passage. This was written by an author and I'm going to read just a portion of it. And I want you to, to listen to see if it sounds familiar. Remember when Jesus called the disciples, what did he call them? He says, come, I will make you fishers of men. Okay, so fishermen. Right. So here's the story. Now it came to pass that a group existed who called themselves fishermen. And lo, there were many fish in the waters all around. In fact, the whole area was surrounded by streams and lakes filled with fish, and the fish were hungry. Week after week, month after month, and year after year, those who called themselves fishermen met in meetings and talked about their call to fish. The abundance of fish and how they might go about fishing. Year after year, they carefully defined what fishing means, defended fishing as an occupation, and declared that fishing is always to be the primary task of fishermen. Continually, they searched for new and better methods of fishing, for new and better definitions of fishing. They created witty slogans and displayed them on big, beautiful banners. These fishermen built large, beautiful buildings called fishing headquarters. The plea was that everyone should be a fisherman and every fisherman should fish. One thing they didn't do, however, they did not fish. In addition to meeting regularly, they organized a board to send out fishermen to other places where there are many fish. The board hired staff and appointed committees and held many meetings to define fishing too, to defend fishing and decide what new streams should be thought about. But the staff and the committee members did not fish. Large and elaborate and expensive training centers were built whose original and primary purpose was to teach fishermen how to fish. And over the years, courses were offered on the needs of fish, the nature of fish, where to find fish, the, psych the psychological reactions of the fish, and how to <laughs> approach and feed the fish. Yet no one fish. When we say that we are a disciple, I'm going to follow Jesus. Jesus said, go and make disciples. He called us to be fishers of men and women and children. That is our primary. Our primary calling is to be with Jesus, and out of that overflow, we're telling others about Jesus. I don't want to be like this parable, where I read a lot of books about fishing, and I buy the equipment for fishing. And I take pictures of fishing. But I don't fish. The Lord has called us to be fishers of men. Which is why, for a while, we're going to be focusing on who's the one person that you can be reaching out to. It is time for us to cast our nets. The Bible says the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. You and me, everyone here, and everyone who says that they are a follower of Jesus, we are called to be those laborers. All right, you may say, I'm not called to preach from the pulpit. Fine. I'm not called to lead worship. Fine. I'm not called to teach Sunday school. Fine. But you are called 
to declare the gospel of Jesus Christ? Who's one person, one person you can reach out to, one person who needs to know that on this planet is not all that they have. That if they don't make a decision to follow Jesus, they may spend eternity away from him. In hell. Who's the one person? Now, we're very good at praying. And prayer is extremely important. It is the foundation. But it has to be partnered with action. Right? So we've given you a little, a little stub that says, who's your one? If you have the name of the person that you are praying for, we would like you to put the name on this stub and then you can leave it on the red table because the leaders, we will collect them and then when we get together for prayer meetings, we're actually going to be declaring salvation and praying for these individuals. On your way out, we want you to pick up a bookmark, who's your one, where you're going to write the name of the person that you gave us to pray for so that you can pray alongside us every day. Pray that the Lord would soften their hearts, that the Lord would give them a tender heart towards the gospel, that their eyes would be open, that their ears would be unplugged, that they would have the grace to receive the truth, and that you will have the grace to share the gospel in a way that is loving and non-threatening and clear. We're going to back it up with prayer, and then we're going to coach you through how to very simply, not in a spooky or religious way, share the gospel. The Lord desires to see his kingdom advanced. We're called fishermen, and we're also called the body of Christ. We are the Lord's mouthpiece. We are his hands. We are his feet in this earth. We are the body that moves on his behalf. We all need to work together to see his kingdom come and his will be done. And it is in his heart to see people come to the Lord. The Bible tells us that he does not want anyone to perish, not one person. But we know people are perishing. We know people are perishing, but it's his desire that no one perish. We don't have to worry about the results. Sometimes I think that that's a deterrent when we share the gospel. What if they say no? What if they reject? That's their decision. But at least you have done your part and you have shared the good news. What good news? What good news? You know, when, when we find out that there's a, a sale on at a, one of our favorite stores, we pass that on. We WhatsApp all of our friends, quickly, go to Lotus, 50% off, go, go, go. Look, we pass on coupons, we share good news. There's no better news than the good news of the gospel. Let's not keep it a secret. Let's pass it on. Let's share it. If people accept, wonderful. If they reject, at least you've planted a seed. The results are not up to you. You don't have to worry about the results. The Holy Spirit will manage that. All you have to do is be the mouthpiece. All you have to do is say, here I am, Lord. You can use my mouth. I will share the goodness of the Lord. And over the next few Sundays, we'll give you very practical ways that you can do it without being intimidated or intimidating. Amen? So who's your one? Are you ready to cast your nets? Yes. Oh. Yes. yes. Are you ready to cast your nets? Yes. yes. We don't want to be like the, the people in this story where we talk about fishing, but we never fish. We want to be fishers of men and women and children. Amen. So who's your one? Don't forget to write the name. Please put it on the red table. We're going to partner with you in prayer. And then you're going to take home.
the step, the bookmark step that looks like this so that you can write the name of the person that you're praying for. And then you need to keep it somewhere that's going to remind you to pray for them daily. So don't put them don't put this somewhere where you're going to forget. <coughs> daily prayer, simple prayer, Jesus, prepare them, prepare me, prepare my friend, prepare my neighbor, prepare my family member to receive you. Prepare me to share the gospel. Amen. Are you ready to go fishing? Yes. Let's stand together. Amen. Yes, remember, we cannot save anyone. All we can do is plant. The Word of God says, one plants, others water, but God gives the increase. So God knows how many people need to water. You know why? Because every seed is the time to bear fruit. The beet sprout takes 24 hours, the durian takes 10 years. Our job is just to keep watering, plant water, and trust God to give the increase at the right time. And we've done our job. And when we've done our job, when we share the gospel, we leave the rest to Him. We sing for all that you've done. I will thank you. <laughs>